Floods, fires, tornadoes, volcanoes, tidal waves, meteorites. When these kinds of natural phenomena occur, they can be cataclysmic, major events bringing with them staggering loss of human life, tragic environmental devastation, destruction and hardship. It's part of being human to be aware of the dangers that are around us all the time. But there's a big difference between doing that and ignoring inconvenient facts or making things worse. After all, life on planet Earth is a fragile enough proposition as it is. So in this rather sobering installment of Desperate Hours, our special focus is on environmental disasters. There are a lot of natural disasters, including volcanoes and earthquakes, that we can't do a great deal about. But there are environmental disasters, and disasters in the making, that would make sense to prevent, if and while we still can. Let's take the long view for a moment, the view from outer space. It seems we, as a species, are poised on the brink of incredible scientific breakthroughs. This has coincided with climate change, some of it undeniably man-made. The Earth seems to be heading for some kind of tipping point. There have been efforts to turn the ship around. You can go back, for instance, to the Kyoto Protocol, an international agreement to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases responsible for global warming. In 1997, when the Kyoto Protocol was signed in Japan, the dramatic effects of climate change were already becoming visible in places. The Marshall Islands, for example, Already just an average of three meters above sea level, islanders were reporting unusually high tides and sea surges. The, the habitable portions of the Marshall Islands and many other island nations could be totally eliminated. Uh, sea level rise actually has the potential to completely wipe out certain societies. Rising sea levels as a result of the polar ice caps melting are one of the troublesome consequences of climate change. And that year, in Kyoto, delegates spoke of their fears. The resulting agreement to mandate country-by-country -country reductions in greenhouse gas emissions was ratified by 150 countries with a notable exception of the US. Developing countries, including China and India, weren't mandated to reduce their emissions. And the protocol didn't even come into effect in some signatory countries for several years. During which time, worldwide greenhouse gas emissions soared by close to 40%. 
more than enough greenhouse gas to offset any reductions made by the Kyoto countries since 1997. For all its limitations and failures, the Kyoto Protocol was arguably a step in the right direction. Any start is a good start if it is followed through. Just look at the pollution all around us, especially in urban areas, the sheer waste that is part of 21st century life. So before we even get into topics like Amazon deforestation or the South Pacific garbage patch, let's take a hard-eyed look into our own backyards. When trash is left in a landfill, greenhouse gases are released into the air and heavy metals seep into the soil. It's one of the worst things we can do to the environment. It is hardly surprising to learn that in the so-called developing countries, or regions where the infrastructure has been weakened by war and crises, that clean and efficient waste disposal has not been that high on the list of priorities. These scenes of squalor and chaos are from the streets of Beirut in Lebanon. In 2015, mountains of waste like these had become a common sight on Beirut streets. It happened after the city's main landfill was closed and the city's management system was in a state of chaos. يجب ايضا اعاده تاهيل المكبات العشوائيه المنتشره في مختلف المناطق اللبنانيه والتي يفوق عددها 760 ومع الاسف برمي النفايات في كل مكان في الاسابيع الماضيه ربما ارتفع هذا العدد الى ما يزيد عن But we shouldn't sneer because waste recycling in first world countries often leaves a lot to be desired as well. There are some places, however, where they're trying to make an effort. These days, Sweden is one of few countries which not only incinerate and recycle their own waste, but they actually import household refuse from around Europe and dispose of that too. In 2011, they incinerated around 800,000 tons of trash in Sweden, most of it imported. Only a tiny percent of the country's own garbage is now left in landfills. This has been made possible because of waste to energy incinerator plants. Det är flera steg av rening vilket gör att vi fångar i stort sett alla tungmetallerna och immobiliserar dem. Vi tar bort dem från miljön och ser till att de aldrig kommer ut i miljön. Critics of the Swedish recycling effort say the process is not without its dangers, however and is even, at best, only a localized, short-term solution to a larger global problem. Countries ideally should clean up their own backyards. When it comes to polluting the oceans, where do we begin? The Great Pacific Garbage Patch also known as the Pacific Trash Vortex. It's a vast gyre of plastic garbage floating in the seas of the North Pacific Ocean. Because it is comprised of untold amounts of debris floating just under the water's surface, its size is hard to estimate. But it's said to cover as much space on a map as the state of Texas. The very existence of the Pacific Trash Vortex is a shameful, hideous blot on the face of our planet. Of course, it did not accumulate overnight, but until recently, nobody seemed to be putting forward any solutions to tidy it up. Then, in 2014, the youngest ever winner of the United Nations Top Global Environmental Prize put forward a plan to rid the ocean of its vast flotillas of plastic garbage. 
that young scientist was 22-year-old Dutch entrepreneur Boyan Slat, and his plan is to use natural ocean currents and winds to send the plastic along floating barriers into a central recycling point. We will never be able to clean up every last kilo of plastic. But we're really focusing on the areas where the plastic is most concentrated. And what we've now been able to show that with a single system in 10 years time, almost half the Great Pacific Garbage Patch uh, can be cleaned up. The first cleanup device is expected to be deployed in Japanese waters by 2016. The worst after effects of an environmental catastrophe have all but vanished a decade later. Take the BP oil spill of 2010. The world was aghast at those images of birds and other wildlife completely coated in oil. Yeah. Well, she's oiled up. It's, it's a young bird. You can feel the oil. I can feel the oil all. An estimated 3.19 million barrels of oil leaked into the Gulf over three months in 2010. But just five years after the BP oil spill, things for the most part seem to have returned to normal along the Gulf of Mexico. You see that the mangroves here are fairly healthy. You didn't see a lot of dead standing mangrove, not a lot of brown, gray. The worst might have been over after a decade, but oil spills are obviously not good for the environment and still happen far too often. This oil spill happened in May 2015 off the coast of Santa Barbara, California. It was estimated that around 500 barrels of oil were pumped into the ocean, quite minimal when you think of the BP oil spill. But as marine biologists observed, this was enough to kill hundreds of animals, with a more precise figure hard to calculate as, of course, the animals affected dispersed to other parts of the ocean. As well as all the other human activity that impacts the environment, these kinds of accidents just ratchet up the toll on our fragile planet. Last, but definitely not least, for the different forms of pollution there are, is of course, air pollution. These days, if you live in any reasonable sized city, it is something you can hardly fail to notice. But of course, it is in the developing world where cities can rise up seemingly overnight, where pollution is usually at its worst. The Chinese city of Beijing held the top spot as the world's most polluted capital city. That was until recently, when the Indian capital of Delhi took over. This, of course, is a dubious distinction to hold. But the problems of smog and exhaust fumes are hardly limited to China or India. In recent years, Paris, the so-called city of light, has looked a lot more foggy than it really should. Un refroidissement nocturne, le sol est très froid, l'atmosphère est chaude. On bloque par un système de couvercle l'ensemble de la de la pollution est piégée au niveau du sol et du coup les concentrations augmentent. To combat the fumes, the city has more than once clamped down on driving and parking permits. They also made public transport temporarily free in central Paris. A nice gesture and a sensible move in terms of city management, but a drop in the ocean in terms of the environment, of course. And not all Parisians were impressed, or even that bothered. Comme c'est fait ponctuellement, maintenant, c'est vrai que je m'intéresse pas trop à ce phénomène, mais je trouve que c'est un peu dérisoire. Carbon monoxide poisoning can, of course, be lethal 
and the number one source of carbon monoxide comes from exhaust fumes. The race to supplant fossil fuels with an efficient source of clean energy has never been more critically important. Speaking of a race against time, trees and other vegetation in the world's forests soak up heat-trapping carbon dioxide as they grow, helping to cool the planet. When trees are cut down improperly or suffer from drought, they release carbon monoxide into the atmosphere as they rot and die. There was a widespread drought in the Amazon rainforest in 2010 that was even worse than the dry spell of 2005 that at the time was called a once-in-a-century event. Each of the two droughts had a bigger impact on global warming than the entire greenhouse gas output of the United States in one year. Right now, the Amazon, the world's largest rainforest, is a bit like an enormous sponge that absorbs carbon emissions and helps cool the planet. Even now, although they are being cleared at an alarming rate, the rainforests of the Amazon still act as the lungs of the planet. Logging that's taking place there is being exacerbated by climate change. So what we're seeing is this vicious cycle being reinforced of illegal logging, um, changing weather patterns, rising temperatures, and as a result, the Amazon is drying, which is releasing more carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And we really need to put a stop to that. If we don't stop that, we could actually dangerously tilt the climate system. The Amazon desperately needs to be protected, and this is an issue for the entire world. The world cannot afford to depend on the efforts of crowdfunding campaigns to save the very air that we breathe. The ozone is a stratospheric layer that protects us by absorbing most of the ultraviolet radiation reaching the Earth from the sun. The ozone is being destroyed by certain manufactured chemicals containing either carbon, chlorine or fluorine. These are the notorious CFCs used in the manufacture of aerosol sprays, solvents and refrigerants. CFCs can deplete the ozone layer at a disquieting rate with a single molecule of chlorine capable of breaking apart thousands of molecules of ozone. These chemicals have a long lifetime in the atmosphere, meaning most of the CFCs released in the last 80 years are still making their way to the stratosphere, where they will add further to the destruction of the ozone. In 2014, there was news that the Montreal Protocol, which banned the use of CFCs, was starting to show signs of success. We must hope they are right. But meanwhile, make no mistake, Mankind has a long way to go if we're going to turn back the tide of climate change and clean up some of the mess created by our presence. In the last decades, there have been some positive signs of progress, but it does seem to be a case of two steps backwards for every step forward. In Lima, Peru in 2014, there were protests at the United Nations Climate Change Conference. 
Activists were furious that UN funds intended to combat climate change were instead being used to build coal-fired power plants. If you had the choice uh, to invest either in more efficient coal-fired power plants or renewable energy, knowing that by mid-century we have to bring down the CO2 emissions to zero, um, there's only one answer. You should invest into renewable energies, which will bring also employment in, into your country, in the countryside, and not only centralized uh, to a few companies. One of the biggest challenges for legislators worldwide is to divide responsibility for climate change between first world Western countries and emerging economies such as China and India. It's not difficult to understand why Peruvians would be particularly environmentally conscious. For one thing, Peru's glaciers have lost more than a fifth of their mass in the last 30 years. Bad news for the 30 million people who live along the country's Pacific coastal desert and depend on the glaciers for survival. This water is for various uses. The principal use is agriculture. Aquí estamos captando agua para poder irrigar 8000 hectáreas de cultivo de diferentes tipos de cultivo agrícolas, pero también la utilizamos para generar energía eléctrica. Tenemos una eh, mini central hidroeléctrica, ¿no? este aguas abajo, que nos está generando 3 megas megavatios de energía, ¿no? Y también tenemos este captaciones para el uso de la población. This could be one of the many consequences of climate change with glaciers and the polar ice caps melting at an alarming rate. Nowhere is this more apparent than the Antarctic Peninsula, which has seen an increase in temperatures of more than three degrees in the last half century. This may not sound like a lot, but water from the warmer ocean is corroding the ice at the rate of an additional 130 billion tons per year. And the rate is accelerating. 97% of the Antarctic Peninsula is still covered by ice. So it's not that it's all melting, it's all going to go away just like that. But a small amount of that ice melting is enough to make a significant contribution to the water going into the ocean, which makes a significant contribution to sea level rise. Scientists estimate that it could take between 200 to 1,000 years for the Antarctic Peninsula to melt completely. Raising sea levels by as much as 10 feet with drastic impact on coastal cities. One of the biggest challenges globally from all of this warming, this melt, is that a lot of the human population lives near sea level. Um, a lot of big cities, a lot of agricultural land, a lot of vulnerable coastline. Temperatures will rise, as well as sea levels. A recent NASA study on climate change found that 10 of the warmest years between 1880 and 2014 fell between 1998 and 2014, with the year 2014 ranking as the warmest on record. Meanwhile, the region around the North Pole is said to be heating up faster than anywhere else on Earth, with sea ice coverage there shrinking by almost a third in the last 40 years. Furthermore, researchers warn new threats to climate stability are about to be unleashed in the Arctic. 
Global warming in high latitudes is causing permafrost in Siberia and northern Canada to thaw. This will release plumes of methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, into the atmosphere. These are not simple matters, even for the scientific community. But as custodians of the planet, are we not better to be safe rather than sorry?